always a mistake to say that the sermon's going to be a little shorter. What an error. Here at the Independence Reformed Bible Church, we do allow for questions following the service. Probably not a lot of questions this morning, but who has one? Or there may be a lot. When our children were younger, uh, one of my parents said, well, if they don't get baptized while they're a child and they die, they won't be saved. Um, so I don't know if that ties into what you were talking about. Um, and how would you actually answer them? You know, I, I would actually respond to that from the uh, very beginning of 1 Corinthians, where Paul says he's thankful that he did not baptize people. Now, if if baptism is going to, you know, if, if somehow water is going to somehow wash away my sins, um, there is one definite hymn that we can dispense with. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the water of baptism as a child. Right? Um, it, 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 but it's a, it's a larger question. You know, Paul's saying, if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ... Christ had to do something that couldn't be done any other way. And I don't have to say, if, if we can wash away our sins with baptism, then Christ is definitely dead in vain. Why did he have to come down and die that horrific death, embarrassing death, painful death, be separated from his father, if all we had to do was crank up the water? There's always plenty of that. A lot more could be said on that. Hi, my name is Donna. I'm just visiting from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania today. It's my first Hi, time at your church. Thank you. Nice to and, see you. And uh, one of the reasons I'm here is um, I just see all that's happening in our nation and Islamic terrorism and what's going on in our political realm. And you know, I'm really trying to understand how to respond to it and what to do. And I've been encouraged. I've never known about the reform of faith and never been introduced to Calvinism until a few months ago. And I think I really... Uh, appreciate the idea of the eschatology, that we need a positive eschatology, that God's sovereign, he's in control, Jesus wins somehow here in the end. And um, I don't know if this will be a topic of your future sermons, but um, again, like how do we prepare or what do we do day to day? Um, I see a lot of churches that are just kind of circling the wagons and waiting for persecution to come. People don't seem to really know what to do. And I, to me, it just seems like we can learn from history and again, that's what I'm maybe hoping to find and learn uh, maybe from your future sermons is, again, what do we do? Just sit back and wait? Or is there something practical to do to prepare for the days ahead? I know. Thank you, Donna. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> what a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> wow. I don't know why everybody's laughing, but I because oh. you're in the right place. Yeah. You know, the, all those questions are questions we attempt to respond to every, every day, really. Uh, because, and I'll, I'll, I'll give this illustration. I know I've given this before, but it's been a while. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Um, my illustration is that I went, to, I, I went to Bible college and we had tests. And the test was always, did you know the material? But well, that was always the problem with, with a Bible college or with any type of teaching like that because the test is never, know, uh, never what you know. The test is always what you did about it. Um, Christ makes that clear in Matthew 7. Two people, the wise man and the foolish man, um, both heard the same message. They both had the same iPod download or whatever. Took the same notes and had the same... Um, syllabus. The only difference between the two was one did something about it and the other, other did not. So ultimately that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to teach everyone here what you are supposed to do. And we see all kinds of responses to persecution in the scripture and in history as well. We see for example the, 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 the Reformation barely hanging on in France 
We see it becoming victorious in Holland and victorious, if you will, in England and Scotland and pretty much being stamped out in Spain. Pretty much buried it there and somewhat in Italy as, as well. I had a conversation yesterday with someone, actually with Seth, our, who passes our daughter church. And we we're talking about this very thing. It seems like the, the enemies of Christ are everywhere. And the, the, the response of the church is to, is to ever decrease the size of fort contraction, I call it. It's just getting smaller and smaller. And the humanist arrows are whistling over our heads ever closer. And our response is to get smaller. We don't know how to give the humanist something to worry about at all. The, 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 those who hate Christ are just not worried about us. And I've made the statement here before that I believe the safest time for the enemy of our souls, for Satan, is Sunday mornings. Because all we can talk about what he's doing to us. He's not too worried about what we're doing to him. He just, he's just not. So, point being here that we're here right now. God in his mercy has given us life and breath. He's given us means. He's given us resources. And my point to my friend Seth, our pastor, I said, you know, I said, I want to get to heaven. And I want to hear, welcome to the joy of the Lord, you, you world beater, you. you. You world changer, you. But that's not actually what's said. Good and faithful servant. And that my job is to be good and those two things, good and faithful. God will do what he's going to do. And so we, we, want, this, we, we want to say, what, it's wicked, it's terrible, and it is wicked, it is terrible. And there's horrific people that are trying to destroy every, the, the, they're not just trying to destroy the Christian, they're trying to destroy the memory of Christianity. They're trying to do it all. What's my job? My job is really faithfulness right now. And that was the job of those people who got persecuted in the Bible, in history, and many of them did not get persecuted. I, I, I think often of Apollos. Paul got persecuted. We did. Paul, Apollos was a tremendous speaker. And we have no, we have no illustration he got persecuted at all except by Christians. The Corinthians probably, apparently didn't like him too much. So we don't know what's going to happen. Here's what we do need to know. We need to be faithful. We need to apply God's word. We need to apply his law. Where we are right now, and we know that we have a sovereign God who is going to handle the rest of it. Too often we worry about his job and not our job. My job in this church is to explain as much as I can what our job is now. Anybody have anything to add? We will be victorious. Amen. I believe our job is to stand against the evil as long as we can. That's right, as long as we have life and breath. And um, what we saw last week in the book of 1 Corinthians is that in time and in history, and this is what we're going to be talking about, in time and in, in, in history, not some later time, in time and in history, the power and the church of Jesus Christ transforms the world, transforms it. And that's why Paul says at the end of this chapter, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It looks like it, does it not? It's not. And Paul knew what he was talking about. Our labor is not in vain. Yes, another question. I was just going to uh, add to what you said um, in terms of what we can do. Um, I just had the news. I listened to uh, Tim Yarborough. Yes. Yeah. He talked about this, and he just um, talked about how we spend our time. And he, uh, he presented it like you know circles. Okay, sure. Uh, you know, most of our time would be spent on self and family. Uh, yes. Sure. And then the second three, um, you know, your close people that you let into your life, your friends, and then the third was local government. Al Premier, you know, was seen in the national. His point was um, that we have the most influence, you know, in those first one or two circles. And the farther out you go, the less influence you have. So I thought that was a good 
reference for, for me in terms of how I spend my time. Absolutely right. Th thank you, Jeremiah. Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. He was called a faithful man. Noah was a loser. He preached for a hundred years, and who'd he save? His family, that's it. And he's called a faithful man. Wow. How are we doing? How are we doing with that? How faithful are we with our own families first? What if Noah would have saved a couple of neighbors and lost his own family? We know somebody like that, right? His name was Lot. Thank you. Another question. Yes. A, a, a kind of a question. When you talked at the, the beginning about uh, people's perspectives and views, and in all honesty, I'll, I'll own up to being kind of like a pan millennialist type of thing because um, I was. You're, you're in the majority, I think. Well, and I, and I think that what I'd like to do is kind of hear uh, your side a little bit more on, on some stuff because you're spending the next five weeks um, to our benefit, and I want to make sure that we I are here, ready to hear what that benefit really is because. As a panelist, I, I, partly why I don't stress too much about that is because there are godly people that I respect on both sides. Um, and so in the end, I have to trust God over a, a, a dogma or a doctrine that I can't fully justify with scripture. Sure. Um, but in the end, I absolutely agree with your larger perspective of that we need to know where we're going. We need to understand uh, the, the final destination and that really impacts right now. But there's a difference between having a, a simple and a simplistic view or a detailed or a, a general confident faith. And so you're gonna be going into some of the details and I'm, I'm kind of curious for you, what do you find, not just for some people, but for the church as a whole and for all members, what difference do specific beliefs make yeah. in the, uh, the benefit the life of a believer? Yeah, um, thank you, Lars. Um, I, I've actually worked a lot of that over in my mind. I'm not sure I'm finished yet, uh, because I think you're asking, I think you're asking for a sort of a comparison, like, like the different the different millennial views. If they come to X verse, how do they how do they make it fit into into their system? And so what I was trying to do was not do that. Uh, perhaps I need to rethink that. Um, well, I've already rethought it a bunch of times, and probably rethink it again, because I don't want to I don't want to be the guy that sort of trashes views as much as I want to present a, 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 a view that not a lot of people know about. And so that's kind of where I'm going with this. In the end, uh, j j just to answer, just to give a very small answer to your question, it's very small. I, I'm, I'm gonna reason it out like this very briefly. Is, is Christ in history, and this has to do with Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 a lot, is Christ in history at war with his enemies or is, or is, he, or is he at, at peace with his enemies? That question has to be answered. Is he at war or at peace with his enemies? If you agree that he is at, at peace with his enemies, then you and I can make peace with his enemies too. And let's just stop with all our, any kind of moral crusade at all. If someone wants to kill our neighbor, let them. We argue this all the time, right? People do these things. Who are we to stop them? Who are we to judge? But if we agree that Christ is at war with his enemies, then we have to ask this question. Does he lose or does he win? Because wars only end up one way, right? You lose them or you win them, despite what our nonsense which is going on with our various bombing campaigns that we do in various parts of the world in these partial wars that we are doing and go in and kill a few people and then get out or whatever it is we think we're doing which is ungodly quite frankly wars a real war ends one way or the other that is as much as I can encapsulate it in a short answer thanks again I thank you very much for your kind attention here this morning